Thanks for coming to today's Priest Brown Bag. Um, I'm going to make our, the intros for our speaker today, but I want to tell you about some of the other things we've got uh, going on. We've got a whole week. Uh, tomorrow we're going to have a, an international expo, or we're taking part in an international expo that actually is uh, going to be sponsored by uh, all the different area study centers on campus, plus a lot of international organizations. Uh, and that's going to happen from uh, the shows here at 11 to 3 p.m on the fourth floor of the Kansas Union. And uh, they're, they're going to have all kinds of prizes for food. Uh, so check it out if you have any chance uh, to go to the Kansas Union. That's tomorrow. And then Friday night, uh, we've got the, the next installment in our Friday night at the Kino, uh, where we've got a, a Bosnian film, episode in the life of an iron picker that's going to be introduced uh, by Marta. Um, and so that's Friday, right here in, from 7 to 9. And then uh, something that we haven't had, uh, you know, done much publicity for, but we're going to have a mini conference. Uh, we've had conferences, security conferences, um, you know, for the last four or five years, and uh, this year we're going to do just a half day. Uh, so it'll be in the afternoon on Monday, March second. Uh, we've got a couple of speakers that are coming in from D.C., including Roger McDermott uh, and Joe Blues uh, by the Cora. and uh, who is uh, originally from Kazakhstan, also with the Jamestown Foundation. Uh, as is Roger, uh, and then we've, we've uh, uh, brought in some local talent as well to uh, speak with. That's going to be over in Marvin Hall, uh, which is the architecture, art and design building, uh, and it's the, the new uh, uh, room that they put on called the Forum. So uh, it's not at the, the KU Union. If you're interested in uh, you know further information on that, why uh, give me a holler. Uh, I'll let you know. It's going to focus on a couple of different hotspots, uh, one being Ukraine and the other uh, being the Middle East, ISIS, uh, that sort of thing. All right, our speaker today is Ray Finch, who is senior analyst at the Foreign Military Studies Office, or FEMSO. Uh, he, he is himself a least grad and uh, one of the driving forces behind the, the FEMSO internship program. Uh, it's benefited a lot of our students as well as CGIS students and research related. Uh, one, of the, one of the parts of his job is looking at a lot of different Russian sources, open sources, and, and trying to figure out what's going on. So, we're happy to have him here and talking about uh, Russia and information strategy. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words about Russia's current information strategy. To set the proper tone for such a serious subject, I thought that I would share a couple of jokes currently making the rounds in Russia. <clears throat> A man walks into a souvenir shop in Moscow and sees a small bronze figure of a cat. On the price label is written, the cat costs a thousand rubles, the history of the cat a hundred thousand rubles. <laughs> the Muscovite asks the salesperson, can I buy the cat without the history? Of course, the salesperson replies, but sooner or later you're going to come back and buy the history. The guy buys a small bronze cat and goes walking along the waterfront. Suddenly he notices he's being followed by a cat and another, and still another. Continuing on, he looks behind him and sees that he's now being followed by thousands of cats. He starts to run away in horror, but the cats aren't far behind. Just as they're about to reach him, he stops and throws the bronze cat statue into the river. All of the cats that have been chasing him immediately jump into the river after the statue and drown. <laughs> the man goes back to the souvenir shop. Didn't I warn you you'd come back for the history, <laughs> remarks the salesperson. To hell with the cat history. Do you have a small bronze statue of Putin? <laughs> <laughs> the second one is also a recycled joke from the Soviet period. Advance this. A group of old babushkas are sitting in a Russian nursing home and watching the Brema evening news. The reports talk about Putin being here, Putin working there, Putin doing all sorts of fun and interesting things. Suddenly, one of the old grannies cries out, I want to live in Russia. The nursing attendant comes up to her and says, Darling, you're already living in Russia. No, replies the old woman. I want to live in the Russia where Putin lives. <laughs> Both of these jokes may reflect some of the effectiveness of the Kremlin's current information strategy. A couple of caveats before we begin. First, this is a huge and complex topic, and there's no way I can adequately cover it in 30 minutes, so I will have to re rely upon some broad generalities. Secondly, I don't claim to be an expert in Russia's information strategy. In my current position as an analyst, 
for the Foreign Military Studies Office at Fort Leavenworth, I spend an average of two to three hours a day monitoring Russia's major media and a variety of Russia, Russian social media sites. In this capacity, I'm not sure if my information diet is representative of what the average Russian consumes. Thirdly, I think the jury is still out regarding the question of media exposure and changes to thought and behavior. There are few conclusive studies which have looked at the long-term effects of incessant propaganda when it is mixed up with all sorts of other media. Finally, if I've learned anything after 25 years of studying things Russian, it's the sheer folly of trying to make definitive statements or predictions on the direction of the country. Still, I have tried to come up with a handful of possible, possible implications that may help to prompt discussion during the QA. Now, you might be asking why I would include Alexander Ivanov's painting, The Appearance of Christ Before the People, which he completed in 1855. For me, it's something of a hopeful metaphor. As you might recall, Ivanov spent 20 years on this masterpiece, agonizing over every little detail. Some claim that Ivanov was operating under the belief that by producing the perfect image of Christ's appearance, the painting, like an icon, might literally transform the viewer, perhaps the Russian nation, or even the entire world. It's pretty clear that the painting did not quite meet this objective. Indeed, some art critics have pointed out that by placing the image of Christ in the distance, Ivanov had weakened the overall impact. I'm not an art critic, but the notion that images, and perhaps words, can change one's perspectives and beliefs is alive and well today. <clears throat> And this is the underlying thesis of my remarks. Like even off 160 years ago, the current Kremlin leadership believes that it can mold Russian society's beliefs and perspectives by controlling both the flow and substance of the information which is consumed. Here's a brief outline of my remarks. As the QA is usually the most interesting portion of these events, I'll try to quickly review my comments. I like this image as it suggests that external forces can program the way you think, see, operate, and see the world. Is this true? If a modern state can control what you see, hear, and read, can they also control your beliefs? Again, my thesis maintains that this is what the Kremlin is trying to do today. For the sake of perspective, let's briefly examine past attempts to control Russia's story. The Russian leadership has a long history of trying to shape and control the dominant narrative. For instance, Russia's first newspaper, Vedomosti, established in 1703, was created to catalog the exploits of Peter the Great. The Kremlin has considerable experience in using all sorts of media as political tools. Before Instagram and YouTube, there was great art. Here you see Valentin's, Valentin Serov's depiction of the anointing of Tsar Nicholas II. The leader is divinely appointed and enjoys a heavenly mandate. Those who dared to openly criticize the Tsarist system, as Radishev did in the 18th century, would be censored or exiled. Even with the limited technology of the Tsarist period, the basic pattern was set. The Kremlin wanted to control information and limit where necessary to strengthen their legitimacy and control on power. Now let's jump ahead to the 20th century to the heyday of the Stalinist period say, the late 1930s. This might be labeled the apex of totalitarian control over information. Soviet citizens were fed a consistent, party-approved diet, which filled them with the belief that the USSR, although surrounded by capitalist enemies, was, under the wise and firm leadership of the dear leader, navigating the country and possibly the entire world toward the communist promised land. Those who dared to question this narrative would be eliminated or re-educated in special camps. Some would say that this totalitarian model proved quite successful. Let's move ahead to the late 80s, 1980s. There are those who claim that the free flow of information prompted by Gorbachev's policy of glasnost helped to weaken party control and led to the dissolution of the USSR. This might be true, and the memory of glasnost may haunt the current Kremlin leadership. I don't want to talk much about Russia in the 1990s under Yeltsin but merely mention that the state's control over the major media was significantly reduced. While it might not have deserved the title independent, as the major media was controlled by various competing oligarchs, 
there was genuine competition in the Russian information sphere. For instance, portions of the Russian media were unafraid to portray the true horror of the Chechen War of the mid-1990s, while other sources pointed out the unfair schemes to redistribute Soviet wealth. <clears throat> Which brings us up to recent history. I like this picture as it serves as a nice representation for how television not only advertises the Putin brand, but also helps to polish and strengthen his image. While the young clerk may not be worshiping her leader, she is exposed to his constant, persistent, and ever-present gaze. Like the rest of the Russian, major Russian media, she is doing her part to enhance his image. Let's briefly examine how the Kremlin has been able to seize the strategic heights of the Russian information sphere. One of Putin's first priorities upon reaching the Kremlin was regaining control over the major media outlets in Russia. Today, nearly all of the major TV, radio, and newspaper outlets are under indirect Kremlin control. The most important sector is television, where upwards of 90% of Russians still get a portion of their news. But it also includes the major press outlets, like Itar Tass and RIA Novosti, which are the rough equivalents to the AP and Reuters. I don't have time here to describe in detail, but the Kremlin has also developed a robust presence on the internet and within major Russian social media sites. The result is a multi-vector approach, harnessing everything from morning talk shows to evening newscasts, from pop stars to venerable academics, from blogs to Twitter accounts, from blockbuster movies to special documentaries, all hammering home 24-7 in the widest variety of formats the Kremlin approved message. For those who have electricity and are plugged in, there is the potential for total media saturation. Gaining control over the information outlets did not necessarily resemble the heavy hand of the Soviet era censor. The Kremlin would simply make offers, offers to owners or editors which they couldn't refuse. They used precise targeting against those who didn't comply. Nonconformists were simply removed, either via quasi-legal means or intimidation. This pro-Kremlin message quickly permeated the Russian informa information sphere. But it hasn't merely been taking over these media assets. More importantly, the Kremlin has invested considerable resources into transforming their portion of the Russian information space into a slick, entertaining, often informative landscape which appeals to both young and old. <clears throat> Having harnessed control over the major media in Russia, the Kremlin can now effectively deliver its message. It shares much similarity to the Tsarist and Soviet propaganda. Let me review just a few of the cogent and ancillary points of this modern message. Vladimir Putin is tough and nearly infallible. A sovereign leader is more effective than the sloppiness of democracy. Like some of his predecessors, Putin may enjoy a divine mandate. Russia is surrounded by the enemies. Russia is at war, and the current battlefield is Ukraine in the global information space. Russia has only two allies, her army and her navy. Those who belong to any political opposition within Russia are likely traitors and are on the payroll of the CIA. Russia is an exceptional country, perhaps with a divine destiny. The Soviet victory in the Great Patriotic War, World War II, is proof of this destiny. Russia saved the world from fascism and is prepared to do it again. Indeed, patriotic Russians today are fighting the Nazi threat in eastern Ukraine. If the country is exceptional, then by extension, those that live within the country live within the borders of the country must also be special. Russia must help the world return to its conservative traditional values. For instance, multiculturalism and gender equality are both failed Western liberal projects, and Russia must reveal the proper societal structure. <clears throat> Stability is much more important than democracy or individual human rights. The strong collective state is more important than the individual. I'm not sure about this last bullet. I'm not sure it should be distraction or confusion. With the 24-7 constant fire hose of digital information and amusement, Russians, like every other modern person, 
uh, like Russians, like every other modern person today, have difficulty sorting true grain from the false chaff. The Kremlin-controlled media provides their audience not only with every sort of bread and circus entertainment, but more importantly, with the greatest possible number of conspiracy theories, lies, horror stories, and absurdities, all cleverly mixed up with elements of the truth as to how the world operates. A related corollary posit that there, posits that there is no such thing as objective truth. All is spin. All is relative. Besides using their daily news programs to pound this message home, over the past decade, the Kremlin-sponsored media has developed an untold number of talk shows where experts discuss and explain what is really happening in the news. These programs are an interesting mix of propaganda, analysis, entertainment, and discussion, designed less to inform than to incite emotions and provoke in indignation sort of like Rush Limbaugh or Glenn Beck on steroids. And one other point bears mention and refers to the title of my presentation. Imagine the Russian TV producer charged with ensuring that his program, programming aligns with the Kremlin's message. Given the nature of the political system and his desire to please the authorities, he might consider overfulfilling the Kremlin's message to pr prove his loyalty. His Russian competitor observes his zeal and follows suit by exaggerating, exaggerating other components of the Kremlin's message. For instance, Channel 1 refers to Ukrainian nationalists as fascists. And so the TV producer on Channel 2 starts referring to, starts referring to them as Nazi fascists. The Channel 1 producer then ups the ante again by labeling the Ukrainians as bloody Nazi fascists supported by the great U.S. Satan. Thus, the Kremlin's initial message becomes amplified and more aggressive over time. As in other countries, one begins to wonder if the media is doing more to shape policy than the political authorities. Some have suggested that the Russian media tail is wagging the Kremlin dog. <clears throat> what then is the overall objective of this strategy and its message? It's actually quite simple. The folks in the Kremlin and those surrounding Putin have developed this strategy to maintain the status quo and their hold on power. They want the Russian people to believe that the current form of government will allow, the, will allow Russia to regain its great power status or at least provide sufficient stability so they and their children can be happy. <clears throat> Finally, what are some implications from the Kremlin strategy to control the substance and flow of information? First, from my perspective, this strategy has been very successful. Despite the Putin cat joke at the, at the beginning of my remarks, the Putin administration continues to enjoy widespread public support. If the poll data can be trusted, the key components of the Kremlin's message have found considerable traction among the Russian population. Few Russians today would throw their Putin statue into the river. And in the past few years, the Kremlin has made significant inroads into the global information space, introducing all sorts of media platforms to spread the pro-Russian message. I don't have any firm data, but I sense that Putin and the notion of managed democracy or strong authoritarian leadership has many adherents around the world. <clears throat> the success of this media campaign might be best illustrated by the ongoing conflict in eastern Ukraine. Again, while the polling data is certainly somewhat suspect, the majority of Russians tend to support and trust the Kremlin-sponsored account. <clears throat> and what are the major elements of their narrative regarding the conflict in Ukraine? Again, it all aligns with the overall Kremlin message. The West, the U.S. in particular, is determined to weaken Russia, and the current battlefield is Ukraine. Now, why does the West or the U.S. want to weaken Russia? According to the Kremlin's narrative, Washington, as the sole superpower, must prevent a resurgent Russia from getting up off its knees after its defeat in the Cold War and becoming a peer competitor to the U.S. Similarly, since modern conflict often stems from a struggle for scarce resources, it will be much easier for the U.S. to steal Russia's abundant natural resources if Russia is weak and divided. As the image on the left indicates, Ukraine is merely a platform 
for the U.S. to get at Russia. Another popular corollary centers upon the notion that the U.S. is intent upon spreading chaos throughout the world. Why? According to some Russian pundits, it is only by continually spreading chaos that the U.S. can prevent other regional powers from becoming strong enough to challenge U.S. supremacy. In the Russian portrayal, the U.S. is the puppet master behind the protests and ongoing violence in Ukraine. Washington has been willing to use all elements of its national power to help prop up the pro-West government in Kiev. Again, in the Kremlin's narrative, by gaining a secure foothold in Ukraine, the U.S. will be in a better position to weaken Russia. <clears throat> To conclude, as opposed to 160 years ago when Ivanov finished his painting about the appearance of Christ, today the Kremlin is theoretically capable of filling the minds of young Russian people with a 24-7 stream of dangerous garbage. I fear that a certain, perhaps not insignificant percentage of Russian people today, particularly the younger generation, will be prepared to fight and die to defend what they believe are genuine Russian interests. Could talk about that lower left picture. That's from Saturday's protest in Moscow where they were protesting against an organization or a movement that doesn't even exist, but we can talk about that later. Um, thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. <laughs>